area or my research interest. Um, so basically, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so again, thank you very much to the organizers of the seminar series to invite me here. I'm really honored and it's really a pleasure to present my work here. And so today I will talk about eco-evolutionary dynamics towards a multi-species perspective. Okay, so eco-evolutionary dynamics has basically come from this awareness that evolution can be surprisingly rapid and can also occur on contemporary timescales as um, ecological processes. And basically evidence of such rapid evolution has been demonstrated for wildly different organisms, varying from bacteria to plants, birds, and larger mammals. And maybe one of the best known examples of such rapid evolution altering ecological dynamics has come from the study on uh, predator prey system, where basically Yoshida and colleagues performed a schemostat experiment using rotifer and algae po uh, populations. And so basically the algae prey population, there they used a monoclonal population versus a multiclonal population. And so in this multiclonal population, they had different uh, prey genotypes that basically experienced a different defense growth trade-off. And so in the absence of the predator or in very low predator densities, um, the undefended prey genotype, so the single cell colony basically has a growth or a competitive advantage, therefore increases a lot in abundance because it is a good food for the predator, the predator also will increase in abundance. Consequently, when we have this high predator densities, basically our defended genotype will get an advantage and increase in abundance. However, because it's a bad food for our um, predator, basically it decreases our predator density again, giving our undefended genotype a competitive advantage. And so the cycle basically restarts. And so when the authors compared the ecological predator prey dynamics um, using this monoclonal versus this multiclonal prey population, they basically discovered that when using this multiclonal prey population, that they got anti-oscillating predator prey dynamics compared to the uh, classical one-fourth lag phase dynamics. And so basically this study very nicely demonstrates that when we have these changes in genotype frequencies, reflecting evolutionary changes that um, to a change in the predator density, that this can alter classical um, ecological predator prey dynamics. And so the authors then also corroborated this finding with um, using a theoretical Lotka Volterra model in which they indeed found this anti-oscillating dynamics back when uh, using a multiclonal population versus a monoclonal population. So this is, very, um, this is a very nice example of eco-evolutionary dynamics and feedbacks in which a change in ecological, uh, or in which a change in ecological property can basically feed back into an evolutionary change. So here a change from uh, the undefended to the defended uh, prey population. And then we, this evolutionary change is then basically feedback on altering back the ecology in the system. And so since then, um, we have many examples that basically um, show how rapid evolution can alter ecological processes as well in natural system as also in more complex experimental settings. And I just want to highlight two examples, one um, in which we observed rapid evolution in a natural Daphnia population in response to cyanobacteria bloom, altering back its own population growth rate and another example in which uh, the authors demonstrated rapid evolution of Daphnia to ecological environments of fish and microphytes, and this basically altered consequently the zooplankton community composition. So first of all, a study um, in a more natural system. So basically together with Lindsay Schaffner and Nelson Harson, we investigated consumer resource dynamics in Lake Oneida. And so what we here looked at is basically um, very classically um, looking at the phytoplankton and zooplankton dynamics in this lake across one season. And we found that they nicely correspond with this plankton ecological group model, where we first see an increase in our phytoplankton uh, densities, followed by an increase in our zooplankton density, so also observed in our uh, field observations. 
then again, we have to decrease with another increase in our phytoplankton. And so it is predicted by this plankton ecological group model that this will consist of inedible um, algae. And so this is also what we observed in our field study. So we went from uh, a high abundance of diatoms to a high abundance of toxic cyanobacteria, which is basically bad food for our Daphnia. But more interestingly, what we also observed is this peak again in our Daphnia densities. So we thought something must be going on. So what we then did in the next step is basically also track clonal frequencies of our Daphnia clones throughout the season. And we selected then seven clones that were then reared in a common garden experiment. So specifically, we investigated the juvenile growth rate of these seven clones in, on a spring food diet and a summer food diet. And so in the spring diet, there was no uh, cyanobacteria used. Well, in the summer food diet, we used a half a percentage or half 50% of cyanobacteria. And what we can observe is that overall, there is a decrease in our uh, juvenile growth rate of all clones. But what we can also see is that clones differ in their response. So we have some clones showing a very shallow response, while other clones showing a very steep response. And so basically, this um, allowed us to um, disentangle this set of clones into resistant versus non-resistant clones. Now, using this information, we then uh, projected or estimated the juvenile growth rate throughout the season. Basically, from these reaction norms, we constructed a linear function in function of the percent of cyanobacteria that we knew um, from this previous figure that we had information over the season. And this allowed us to calculate um, juvenile growth rate throughout the season. And then we used these juvenile growth rates to calculate a mean juvenile growth rate for the population and linked it back to population densities. And this was only um, to then basically have an idea of the observed Daphnia densities. And we used the same technique to then make a no evolution projection. And so in the no evolution projection, we had, we basically kept the frequencies of our clones at the beginning of the season constant throughout the season. So we did not take into account the potential uh, changes in the clonal frequencies. And this way we basically prevented um, evolution from occurring in our system. And then we could calculate the Daphnia densities when no evolution, so when our clonal frequencies stayed constant. And so based on these two calculations, we could basically um, see a difference in the Daphnia densities that um, occurred because um, evolution was basically prevented from occurring. And so if we then look at the relative change in densities by basically dividing these two numbers, we can basically see how much of the population is retained when no evolution occurred. And so what we see is basically over the season, there is really a drastic reduction in the population densities if no evolution would have occurred. So basically this example very nicely illustrate that because of the rapid evolutionary responses to cyanobacteria, the Daphnia population was able to keep um, these high population densities. As a second example, um, I would like to highlight the study of Pantel and colleagues. And so basically um, here, these authors used a natural Daphnia population. They placed it into four ecological environments of presence of fish or present or absence of macrophytes. After the selection experiment, they collected adapted Daphnias and then non-adapted Daphnias from the original population and placed both populations each in these four environmental or ecological conditions. They then evaluated Daphnia densities. And so basically they observed that when Daphnias were not adapted to their environment, this resulted in a reduction in their density. But what they also observed when they looked at community structure is that the ecological effects on the community structure of the fish predation and the macrophytes had an equal in magnitude effect as the effect of evolution being adapted or not adapted on the community structure, but was opposite in sign. Okay, 
So basically, we see many studies um, provide evidence of rapid evolutionary changes and that can also um, alter ecological dynamics. However, still a lot of studies in eco-evolutionary dynamics focus on a single species or focus on evolutionary responses in a single species. And this means it remains largely unknown how eco-evolutionary dynamics play out in multi-species settings in which, in which multiple species can simultaneously evolve to environmental changes. And so this is basically the main aim of my research. And I want to tackle this from a, a conceptual, theoretical, experimental and field um, approach. But for the purpose of this talk, I will mainly focus on, uh, on the conceptual work. And so moving towards a multi-species perspective of eco-evolutionary dynamics is highly relevant because when we look outside or in nature, then we can see that all species are embedded within communities. And I also showed earlier that species respond and can evolve to species interactions. So for example, this predator-prey um, system in which we observed rapid evolution of our prey population to uh, predation but also studies have shown rapid evolution in response to competition. And for example, the study of Simon Hart used two different um, duckweed species, basically showing um, when allowing evolution to competition versus preventing evolution to competition, this resulted in a different genotype composition of one of the species at the end of the experiment. More interestingly, we can also see that species interactions can further alter species responses to environmental change. And this is by a study of Tess Granger, who showed that competitive history shapes rapid evolution in a seasonal climate. So basically, they use Drosophila populations in the absence of competition versus the presence of competition, collected then individuals of these populations and found that they differently respond to future environmental changes. And the other way around, uh, my work shows that basically species evolutionary history can actually alter species responses to competition. So here I use two freshwater ciliate species. They were evolved in a low versus high salinity condition. And I then placed them together um, in a competition experiment in which they either had the same evolutionary history, so either coming both from a low salt um, environment or where they had a different evolutionary history. And so what I found is basically when your competitor was naive to the environment you were competing in, this basically gave the focal species a competitive advantage. And then other studies have also demonstrated that the magnitude and sign of species interaction often depends on the presence of other species and that the presence of a third species can alter the strength and direction of selection in two species communities. So clearly indicating that we should not only move um, from a single species to a two species, but that we really need to include more complex uh, communities. And this also demonstrates that within communities, we basically can have multiple potentially very complex eco-evolutionary dynamics going on. And so my aim was basically to somehow find a framework in which we can understand these dynamics and in which we can understand how different processes contribute to the community patterns we observe. And so what I would like, uh, what I would now like to present you is a kind of conceptual framework for eco-evolutionary community dynamics. And so this has been a collaborative effort with a, a large team of people, which I would like to thank uh, for contributing to this work and for the very interesting discussions we had. So basically what this framework, so by starting to think about this framework, we went back, um, what is eco-evo community dynamics? So on the one hand, we have evolutionary biologists who are interested in changes in allele frequencies they focus often on genetic composition and diversity and how this varies across space and time. And so on the other hand, we have the community ecologies, which are interested in changes, mostly in changes in species abundances and focus on how species composition and diversity varies across space and time. So these in the sense look very similar if you abstractize the entities um, that these researchers are interested in. <clears throat> 
And we also know that evolution is driven by these four fundamental processes, selection, genetic drift, gene flow, and mutation. And also more recently, Mark Belland very nicely synthesized in his book, The Theory of Ecological Communities, that we have these um, parallel processes in community ecology. So we have selection, ecological drift, dispersal, and speciation. And so what I would like now to do is first highlight two processes and then uh, build the framework further. So first of all, selection. So selection is basically this deterministic process by which individuals perform differently in a specific environment. And so at the community level, these differences lead to species sorting. So basically in the rest of my talk, I will refer to this as species sorting to um, distinguish from selection occurring at the population level. Okay, then mutation and speciation. So these are a bit different compared to the other processes because they create new genetic variants or new species in situ. And so while the other processes rather reshuffle existing uh, variation, we also know that speciation often occurs much slower than mutations, but there are some exceptions. And then very last, mutations are a molecular process, while speciation is ultimately an evolutionary process. But because it adds the species to a community, we uh, consider it as a community analog for mutation. Okay. So basically we have for evolutionary biology, community ecology, we have these four parallel processes, each uh, generating genetic diversity and species diversity, but it's also these processes that basically occur on similar timescales and can therefore potentially interact. So basically by investigating or by explicitly taking interactions um, between these fundamental processes into account, um, we can basically move towards a more mechanistic understanding of um, eco-evolutionary community dynamics. And so if we reorganize this a little bit differently, we can see it as a 16 element matrix in which we have our community processes and our evolutionary processes. And this, um, by imagining this matrix, we can really start to understand the variety of eco-evolutionary dynamics within communities that are generated by these processes. So one can envision to have like pairwise interactions between each of these processes, but also um, investigating sets or subsets of um, multiple processes, how they interact and which community patterns they arise. And so in the next part of my talk, what I would like to um, focus on at least to give a little bit structure in the upcoming chaotic uh, slides. So first I would um, then would like to give an example of a potential interaction between one of, uh, one of these evolutionary and community processes. I want to highlight an existing framework and their fundamental processes they incorporate. I want to show how it can provide an anchor for experimental designs and then uh, illustrate some fruitful and unexplored directions or some unexplored research questions. So first of all, let us look at a potential example. And this comes from a study of Richardson and Urban who basically looked at the spotted salamanders um, that live in different ponds. And in these ponds, they experience, these salamanders experience a different predation regime of the marbled salamander. So we either have a low, intermediate, or high predator regime. And so these authors basically looked at the genetic relatedness among individuals. And so if they made this plot by isolation by distance, it looked um, not so, not very clear patterns came out. However, when they looked at it um, from a predation regime perspective, it looks way more structured and way, ni uh, way more nicely. So basically this means that genes could flow freely between the communities of these salamanders, regardless of the distance, but that it was the dissimilar predation regimes that limited gene flow. So potentially showing the uh, effect of species sorting on uh, gene flow. And the other way around, we could also envision that gene flow might actually change species interactions between these two species and therefore further influence species sorting. So this study just showing as a potential way of um, linking these evolutionary and community processes 
and understanding the patterns they generate. To highlight an existing framework, so basically by um, providing this conceptual framework of community processes and evolutionary processes, I don't want to say that we should forget about all existing processes and only focus on this one. Um, I merely want to somehow create maybe an overarching umbrella and in which we can place existing frameworks, identify which processes they frequently look at, and maybe we can from those processes identify the patterns they uh, generate and somehow find a more mechanistic or predictive framework of eco-evolutionary dynamics based on these processes. Um, and so just one of the frameworks I would, um, would like to highlight is of evolving meta-communities. So evolving meta-communities basically focuses on integration of local and regional processes to understand ecological and evolutionary dynamics. And if you look in the literature of evolving meta-communities, then they basically focus on these four set of processes very intensely. And so then we can basically from there observe um, which patterns they, um, or which patterns result from these processes. Okay. Then uh, this framework, by explicitly evaluating the specific processes, it can also give an anchor for experimental designs. So these four processes, in principle, generate species diversity and genetic diversity. And we already have a lot of studies who basically um, give such designs in which they vary uh, species and genetic diversity, and then go and evaluate mostly its ecosystem functioning. But maybe it would also be interesting to see which um, community patterns they, um, these different treatments would result in and which processes are actually present and um, interact to give you the community pattern. For example, if you would place such a design in two different environments, we could potentially alter the interaction between selection and species sorting. Now, another way, another um, uh, interaction between fundamental processes that we evaluated was not really well studied is the or is the interaction between genetic drift and ecological drift. And so we know that in small community sizes, we expect a larger effect of ecological drift. Um, with small population sizes, we basically affect um, a large effect of genetic drift. So we might expect that in a small community, with small population sizes that especially ecological and genetic drift might interact very strongly. But I'm not sure if this has already been tested. And so this is just to basically back up a study by Gilbert and Levine indeed showed that when we vary community size, um, going to larger community sizes reduces the extinction of species. And so we can imagine by basically having such a design combining it with maybe varying genetic diversity, we might allow um, or identify interactions between a genetic and ecological drift. Then some other unexplored directions is if genetic drift um, affect community structure and dynamics via altering these uh, fundamental processes. So again, we might expect that genetic drift um, or that the impact of genetic drift on these community processes might be large when we have small population sizes? Or how do each of these evolutionary processes could potentially interact with ecological drift? So here again, um, we might expect that evolutionary processes that reduce community size will increase the effect of ecological drift. This might then lead to alternative community assembly trajectories, even though community sizes increase again following adaptive evolution. Then some unexplored research questions. So basically I want to highlight two um, research questions. So one, we now have all of these um, processes. So basically now we have to move towards a step if we can identify if specific interactions between this evolutionary and community processes can result in similar or dissimilar eco-evo dynamics. And can we uh, predict eco-evolutionary dynamics based on the interactions between this evolutionary and community processes. And so what I want to highlight is similar and predict, because this is 
while these are very nice questions, they, they also basically point to another problem. Because what are, for example, what do we consider as similar eco-evolutionary dynamics? Does it mean that we see similar community compositions at specific time points, similar genetic compositions? Is it just similar temporal dynamics? Or do we only care about the community function in the end, um, while there might be different species present? And so just to um, give a little bit uh, a guidance of a step forward, so we have this study by Rio et al, who looked at the basic principles of temporal dynamics. And in this study, um, temporal dynamics were basically classified following specific types, characteristics, or patterns. And so maybe this study can be a first step towards finding basic principles of temporal ego-evo uh, dynamics. So this is just uh, a first step in which we can move to, okay, we want, we have the processes, we want to know which patterns they generate. If we have the patterns, how we can basically compare these different patterns. Now, we all, so now we already have this framework, we know that the different processes interact, so now it would also be interesting to know how relatively important are each of these evolutionary and community processes to the dynamics we observe. If we, for example, have each of the four processes interacting, is selection more important compared to genetic drift? So this could be um, this might be relevant to know if you want to identify the key processes for your system. And so again, here we can imagine to design theoretical models that either include or exclude specific processes, the same for controlled experiments, or we can envision to do a meta-analysis or a synthesis study where we gather or scan the literature to find uh, patterns of how important are these processes. And just... Um, to highlight a controlled experiment. So we could imagine a situation where we have communities that are in a low ambient or high environmental condition and where we really want to manipulate um, if evolution can occur or not. And so we can here prevent, for example, evolution to competition by um, using populations that evolved in the condition but not to the competitors and substituting um, so the populations or individuals by these uh, individuals. Then we uh, can also prevent evolution to abiotic selection, for example, by uh, substituting the individuals in the initial communities by individuals that experience the competition, but not the abiotic change. And last, we can prevent evolution to competition and abiotic selection. So by basically substituting individuals in the initial communities by individuals that did not experience competition and did not um, experience the abiotic selection. Now, this is all very nice, but it still does not allow us to really um, quantify how important um, one or the other process is. And for that, I would like you to introduce eco-evolutionary partitioning metrics. You might wonder why there is a sandwich on the slide, but this will come clear very soon. So eco-evolutionary partitioning metrics is basically this quantitative method to calculate the contributions of ecological and evolutionary processes to trade change. And here I focus on community trade change. And so in eco-evolutionary partitioning metrics, traits are also placed very central in eco-evo dynamics, because on the one hand, traits can evolve, and they're also linked to ecological processes or interactions. So if they evolve, they alter ecology, which can induce more selection, so traits involve. When we look at our community, then uh, basically our community consists of different species. Species might have different traits. So if we have a shift in species abundances, we can have a change in our community trait. Our species can consist of different genotypes with different traits. So if we have changes in our genotype frequencies or evolution, this can basically feedback on having a, a change in our community trait. And also genotypes can consist of different individuals. And here an individual can also change a trait due to an environmental response, such as phenotypic plasticity, or maybe due to ontogenetic development. So this can also change the trait at the community level. 
And so here we basically see that our community trade change can occur or can be due to uh, changes occurring at each of these levels. And this is basically what we translated into this eco evo sandwich in which, in which we have our evolutionary trade chains occurring at the individual, uh, at the intermediate level, the species level, basically sandwiched between two non-evolutionary processes. So one at the community level, species sorting, and one at the individual level, phenotypic plasticity. But this framework also highlights that we should not only focus on the main effects, but also should take um, this eco-evolutionary interactions into account, such as between species sorting and evolution, but also evolution of plasticity. And to give an example of such an eco-evo partitioning metric, so the price equation has been developed by George Price in 1970. And originally this equation um, partitions your population trade change into a selection component and transmission bias. But we can also use it on a community uh, of different species where species consist of different genotypes. If we can track our genotypes over time, we can basically partition our community trade change into a species sorting component, genotype sorting and trade change within genotypes. Now this sounds all very nicely, but what is actually um, even nicer is that we can try to link our fundamental processes processes that we had earlier to the terms in this equation. And this can allow us then to have a, a measure of how important a specific process is to the community trade change we observed. And so our species sorting links to species sorting, but might also have effects of ecological drift. Genotype sorting has our selection and might also have genetic drift. And then trade change within genotypes might, for example, be because of mutation. So we are left with gene flow, dispersal, and speciation. So if we have, for example, um, more detailed information on how our community uh, looks like and what processes that we are aware of occur in our community, we can basically try to link these remaining processes to um, mathematical terms. So for example, imagine I have this community of these three green species. The orange species suddenly um, is new but due to speciation. We know that there are some new species coming in through dispersal. And we might also know we lose some species and maybe this is because of ecological drift. And so by first partitioning our trade change over the shared species and then over a species gain and a species loss term, we might be able to get into this dispersal and speciation effect or ecological drift. And so we can then even further extend this equation to also include gene flow genetic drift. Um, I'm not saying that this is the solution. I'm just um, showing a potential way of how we can incorporate these fundamental processes into um, these mathematical partitioning metrics. And so for uh, the very end of my talk, I would like to just highlight the default or talk a bit about the default of eco-evolutionary partitioning metrics. Um, so basically when we look so often, we think of eco-evolutionary dynamics because evolution is this temporal process over trade changes over time. And so we have our trade distribution that changes over time. We often focus on mean trade changes and basically we look at how the mean trade value at time point two um, compares to the one at time point one. Now there also exists a lot of studies that look at spatial trade differentiation. And so here you have spatially um, separated populations that also have a trade distribution. Now, again, I put here the price equation on. So if we would look at our community trade change, what we see is the abundance of our species at time point two minus the abundance at time point one. The same here, the abundance of our uh, genotype at time point two minus the abundance of the genotype at time point one. The trade value of the genotype at time point two minus time point one. And this sounds very logical that we subtract our first time point from the second, because we basically want to observe how this trade at time point two differs from the trade at time point one. <clears throat> 
So if I would um, apply this logic to the spatial landscape, I would say, oh, I want to compare the trait at my site two to the trait at site one. However, imagine I labeled them just differently, then I would maybe be comparing my site one to my site two. And this sounds very innocent, but the problem is if you apply this to, or put this in your partitioning metric, so basically the terms that um, have these rectangles seem pretty similar. It's abundance at time point or at site two minus site one or site one minus site two. So it gives basically the same value, but a change in the sign. There is however a difference in the trait value it is multiplied with. And because of this difference, so here it's the trait at time point two or at site two, and here's the change uh, the trait at site one. And because of that multiplication of a different trait, we, can, we get a different contribution of our process. And so this is potentially the most ugly slide in my presentation, but I just want to make the point that if we compare trait change from population one to population two, using partitioning metrics, um, we might find a different contribution of how important evolution is. So depending if I took trait chain or the trait from population one to population two, I might find everything is explained by evolution. If I go the other way around, maybe only 50%. And so if you have populations or communities in a spatial landscape and you want to calculate or quantify how important is evolution, you don't want it to depend on which population you pick as a reference. And so this is some recent work that um, I have been doing is basically uh, finding ways how we can extend these partitioning metrics that are or that have this dependence on the reference to use them for spatial study systems. And we came up with three different ways. So first of all, um, either you construct or choose a common reference and compare um, all the ecological or calculate ecological and evolutionary deviations from this common reference. So either you pick one of your populations or communities as a reference, or you create a group mean. If you can't choose, um, a second way is if you can't choose the direction, maybe just calculate both and take an average. Um, but what is more interesting is that we would basically have partitioning metrics available that do not depend on this reference. And it's on this last one that I quickly want to um, highlight a spatial extension of the price equation. So here I um, put two price equations. So now they're at the population level. So where we go from site one to site two or from site two to site one. And again, we see here our abundance at site two minus site one, abundance at site one minus site two. We already know there is a difference because of the trade value. And so after staring a little bit or quite some time to these equations, I thought if we take the average of these trait values, actually it doesn't matter if I go from one to two or from two to one, because this value will stay the same. And this one will have the same magnitude, but just a change in the sign. And so I did the same for the abundances. And basically this gives us a price equation that is independent of the reference. But this only works um, between two or within a pair of populations. And now you might think, okay, it's fun to play with equations. I totally agree. But why is this now relevant? And so it becomes very relevant when we start to have um, multiple spatial communities and we can calculate the evolutionary contributions in a landscape. And so here, this is data collected by Sarah, Sarah Rousseau. So we had 20 ponds in Belgium. We had information on the environment, on the community composition, on trade data of some abundant taxa, also of trade data of Daphnia magna and neutral molecular markers. And so what we did is in a first instance, calculate the impact of local evolution to the community trade change for three traits. And the only uh, takeaway message from this slide is basically that we saw a lot of variation in the impact of uh, local evolution to community trade change. So there was a lot of spatial variation. And we then linked this spatial variation to potential drivers. And so what we did, we identified drivers, uh, landscape drivers, 
or a link to population genetics and communities. And to make a very long story short, as we basically found that it were the community drivers that explains most of the spatial variation in this impact of evolution on community trade change. So we initially expected to um, have population genetics to determine how much evolution could occur. But here it was really the community somehow that shaped the evolution that occurred that then further impacted the community. And with this, I would like to come to some conclusions. So I probably threw a lot of information at you, but basically I wanted to introduce this um, fundamental framework to studying eco-evolutionary community dynamics based on these um, community and evolutionary processes, hoping that um, by maybe taking these um, processes or the interaction between these processes into account, we can go to a more mechanistic understanding of eco-evo community dynamics. Now we definitely need some follow-up theory models and experimental designs. Then I also showed you how eco-evo partitioning metrics could be used to quantify the contributions of these processes, but also be wary of the default of most eco-evo partitioning metrics is that they depend on this directionality. Um, but I showed you some, well, I did not show too much, um, but I showed some ways to um, potentially extend these um, eco-evo partitioning metrics to a spatial study system. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I would also like to thank all of the people that were involved in this massive amount of work. And I'm very happy to take any questions that you may have.